This episode is sponsored by Fire and Fuel Coaching, where I help you discover who you are and where you want to go, both on and off the job. For more information, please reach out to me at my Instagram handle at Jerry Fire and Fuel. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Enduring the Badge Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund, and I don't want you to miss an upcoming episode, so please hit that subscribe button. And while your phone's out, please do me a favor and give us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It says, hey, this podcast has a great message, and we should send it out to more people. So please take that 30 seconds to a minute to do that review, and just maybe by doing that, it'll push this up into someone's podcast feed that really needs this message. Hey, everyone. I want you to know how committed and dedicated I am to you. I truly appreciate and love those in the first responder world and those who surround them. They're an incredible, important part of my life. And I know if you're listening, they are yours as well. And that's why I have these guests on. I have these truly amazing guests on so you can learn from their struggles and maybe find those ways to improve your life. If you're struggling through life, and not being able to pick up on maybe some of these tips that these amazing guests are giving you, I offer a free 15-minute phone call with no obligations. I'm going to talk to you about you living up to your greatest potential and ways I can uplift you and assist you in your self-discovery and having you create true connections to people around you so you don't feel alone in this world that is so big And sometimes we feel so alone with what we're going through and our emotions. My job is to get you to your greatest potential and find ways to motivate you to do that. So please feel free to jump on a 15-minute phone call with me. You can find information at the website, Enduring the Badge Podcast. And there's a little icon on the bottom right where you can leave me a voicemail or you can go to the coaching tab and schedule a call there. Or please feel free to reach out to me with a message on Instagram at Jerry Fire and Fuel. That's my personal one or at Enduring the Badge Podcast. My very special guest today is the creator and owner of Prep Medic. Sam Groff is a critical care flight medic and a member of a special operations response team in Northern Colorado that attaches medics to high call volume SWAT teams. Sam has got a lot of other experience in law enforcement that he shares with us. He also has a great YouTube channel and social media platform where he shares knowledge about paramedicine and he gives you some things that you can implement that's evidence-based. He also goes into some gear review and give you some other insight on those platforms as well. We're also going to dive down into a little bit about mental health with Sam. We talk about it's okay to be okay and sometimes... As individuals, we respond to things differently than other individuals. We're all humans and have emotions, but sometimes we all don't share those same emotions. So we're going to talk to Sam about feeling okay. Sometimes you'll have other people that are not feeling okay that go into the same call, and how do you deal with that? So let's jump right into this episode with my very special guest. How you doing, Sam? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Sam, can you tell the audience just a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, so uh, I am a currently a flight paramedic. I uh, got my start back in the day in the Midwest uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, then in Central Iowa as a ground paramedic. Uh, kind of started a parallel career path at that time doing uh, SWAT medicine, was a, a reserve deputy and an entry team member for a team out there and their their team medic. And that kind of evolved over time, as many people do. I moved with my wife out to Colorado, continued the SWAT medicine stuff on the side. Uh, Also started a YouTube channel about that same time, which uh, my wife is still amazed that people want to hear me talk on a regular basis. Um, And then uh, got into flights out here and have been doing the uh, critical care uh, flight medicine game for about uh, two and a half years now. So uh, that's where I come from. Yeah, that's awesome. So you are you still doing SWAT medicine stuff too right now? Yes. So out here, it's a little bit more broad. So I'm on a special operations team, a special operations response team out here that does uh, SWAT medicine for two teams. And then we do a uh, search and rescue, dive rescue, and some high angle stuff as well. Wow. So you're kind of a jack of all trades. Yeah, do, do a lot <laughs> and definitely a master of none. 
<laughs> yeah, I feel you when you kind of get in these uh, different lines of work, it's hard to be a master of everything. And, you know, like and be a flight medic and be a SWAT medic and do all these things because you have to spread your time out with everything. Yeah, it, it's almost like being a firefighter in this day and age. I feel like, you know, you you've got you know, your fire suppression and your rescues and your vehicle extrications, hazmat and all of that other stuff lumped into one. So it gets to be yeah. a lot. Yeah, definitely. How does your wife handle all that, uh, you know, that you're juggling? Oh, man, she's a, a medical resident, so I never see her anyways. And she's way busier <laughs> than I am, even with all of that stuff. So I she wouldn't know one way or the other. <laughs> you guys are just meeting, meeting, crossing paths, basically, huh? Exactly. Exactly. Luckily, our, our son's still too little to really to really understand it. So hopefully we slow down relatively soon. Yeah. Now, how how can you survive a marriage like that? Like, how, how do you make that work with being so busy? You know, I, I think the biggest part of it for us has just been like carving out the time no matter what it takes. Yeah. Um, you know, we both have vacation, you know, she's a resident, but she still has vacation. She, she still has time and uh, really just setting it as a priority. You know, I, I try to put out a prep medic video every week. I'm working my shifts on the helicopter. I'm doing my on-call shifts for Thames, um, all of that stuff. But, you know, I those things have to take a back, back seat sometimes. And I our priority list isn't like a set list. Um, it's not something where I always prioritize her first and you know, my kids second and job third, like sometimes the job comes first, but sometimes also the marriage comes first. And I think we've had a lot of success of just uh, arranging them according to what we need in that moment, you know, what what really has to be done. Um, but that's not to say we have it all figured out. You know, that's every year is different. Every day is different. Uh, and we I couldn't sit here and tell you that we don't fight about it periodically. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I don't think anybody listening figures, you know, that they have everything figured out, especially when it comes to relationships and working, you know, these types of professions and your wife, you know, being so busy too. I do really like carving out the time. Um, my wife and I have a goal to go somewhere every 90 days. And then we try to have a date night uh, once a week because it's important to have that connection. Yeah. Yeah. And if that if that starts going downhill, I mean, I think we've all had that coworker that things aren't going right in their personal life and yeah. nothing goes right in their life at that point. Like you, they're not doing well at work. They're not doing well at home. You know, they're not having fun out. And I think that's really the baseline, at least from my perspective has been your home life has to be squared away for you to actually be a competent uh, medical provider, firefighter, police officer, whatever it is. I think that's, that's key. Yeah. Cause it totally affects your emotions. I mean, yeah. it's, it, you, you can't check them at the door. There's just no way to like perfectly check those at the door. No, if somebody has a, a system for actually doing that for real and not just saying it, I'd, I'd like to meet them. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. They probably don't have any kids. <laughs> yep. Yep. I agree. That they're, they're always the, the wild card and so many things that, you know, we do and work in these crazy hours. Yeah, my coworker put it best. I think he said kids make everything harder, not necessarily worse, but everything yeah. harder logistically, emotionally, like it's just not the same. I our son is um he's like 13 months now and I look back on like what my obligations were before that. I'm like, wow, my life was so easy. Yeah, yeah. And now it's not. Right, right. <laughs> and now people are, you know, uh pets are so huge in people's lives. Um, you know, that's kind of like just like having a kid, people really look to them as their as their kids and taking up a lot of time. I saw kind of a funny ad for Amazon. They were hiring people and it says and it was a picture of a bunch of different pets. And it's like, please don't leave us at home alone. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, a prompt for people to, you know, work remotely. And I was like, dang, you know, yep. they're catching on. Yep, they're they're getting it. Uh, we're still waiting on some legal protections for it. I think that's the one the one downside there. But yeah. yeah, I think companies are starting to realize that that's a thing that that matters to a lot of people. Right. Why Why did you form a passion for SWAT medicine? So you know that came up really as a community need, and um, you know that was one of the things we wrote down to kind of talk about is that. Uh, I've found a lot of success in looking at 
what the community I'm working in needs or what they lack and working to establish that. So back in central Iowa is where I kind of started it. We were in uh, Ames was the city and then Story County uh, was the surrounding area. And um, both both areas like Ames had a population of, I want to say, 100,000 people uh, ish in Story County. You know, with that encompassed, there were two SWAT teams, both relatively low call volume. But um, between the two, there were no medical providers. Um, There was no Like at the time, we didn't even have vests on our ambulance. We had no rescue task force. We had nobody on SWAT. And that seemed like a big gap to me. And we'd have, you know, officers coming into the ER and they'd have, uh, you know, their tourniquets were all messed up on their their stuff. And we'd try to fix them. And I'd start to replace their things out of our storeroom. I'm pretty sure I was stealing, but nobody called me on it. (laughs) Um, You know, start replacing some of their stuff, giving them like packing gauze. And starting those conversation, and that's where they kind of got interested. They're like, well, we don't have this. What do you, what would you do? And I kind of talked about, you know, Thames and how some other organizations were doing it. And the officers, the ground level officers were super all about it. Yeah. And in that time, uh, you know, talking with them, forming those relationships, I put myself through a couple tech med classes just to see what it was all about. Because I, I wasn't a, a subject matter expert. It wasn't like I had the skill set going on or going into it. And through those connections, they told me about the reserve deputy program, um, which was you go through the ILEA Police Academy, except in like a weekend by weekend basis. It takes you about like a year to get through the whole thing. And then you can go through an FTO process with the sheriff's office. So applied did that, did my academy, and then started applying to their uh, emergency response team, which was their version of SWAT. Uh, Got on that. And then like the second I was through the door, it was kind of one of those, hey, guys, we should do this. Hey, guys, can we get this? (laughs) And they were they were so supportive of it. They they got me, you know, a NAR4 aid bag, stocked it for me. My employer um, that was working full time as a paramedic was like, yeah, whatever you want to do, just just go do it. The medical director had a checkbox it helped that she was married to one of our main paramedics so oh, nice yeah you know, it wasn't there wasn't too much barrier but through that really kind of found the community need and then just worked to start it which is a program that's still going today even though i've been out of it for uh about four years now yeah that's awesome i i love being a swap medic as well it's uh it's a unique bond that you have with your team members and uh, it, it's just different. The training is just different. And I, it's different than, you know, the fire and paramedic training and stuff that I do. It's just something completely different that really engages me. And I have a, a passion for it's just a, I want to be there for those guys, right. And gals that are on the, on the SWAT team. Yeah. And it, you know, it's interesting. I'm sure you guys have experienced it, but it's so multifaceted where I got into it thinking it was, you know, slinging tourniquets with bullets flying overhead. And, you know, the reality is, is that that is such a small percentage of what uh, a good SWAT medic is doing. You know, you're looking at, you know, hydration needs, fatigue of your team. You're looking at like the small things, headaches and blisters and trying to optimize their performance. And then, you know, they'll come in and they'll, you know, have the the sore on their hand or something and ask you to look at it you know it's all these little things and that's what builds this relationship so that when things actually are going really south when things are really in a stressful situation you've had all of these little micro interactions with them you've proven yourself and now you have that bond and you can go in and actually like do what you thought you were doing uh from the beginning but it was it was kind of like peeling back an onion of looking at all of these different considerations going into it and realizing that it's not really as like cool guy as I think it's made out to be. Um, vests kind of suck. They're kind of heavy and, you know, they're kind of hot and like they don't keep you warm either in the cold weather. But, you know, all of those little things, I think, really make it worth it. And you can make a huge difference, not just for the officers, but for the people they're coming in contact with, you know, whether it's the mental health patient having a really bad day. Uh, that happens to have some violent stuff going on where they had a SWAT team called or, you know, the hostage in a a, a HRT scenario, something like you can make a huge difference. And it's kind of cool to be be part of your community in a in a different way. Yeah. How'd you feel about picking up a new skill set, you know, with firearms and things like that? 
Yeah, you know, that was probably my biggest insecurity, um, just going into uh, the Reserve Academy, because I kind of had this vision that like, every, every officer was a gun guy, everybody, you know, was going to be way better than me. And I am way out of practice now. But like going into it is interesting to kind of like, it was a really supportive community. You know, yeah. I was really open of like, hey, I'm not good at this. Like, this is new for me. I, I can, you know, start an IV, but I'm not sure about about doing this qualification. And they were really supportive, you know, took me out, helped, helped out and stuff. And, you know, it was about, about like a year before I felt like actually competent with a firearm, despite quals and the classes and everything. Yeah. Like, it took a while, but I thought it was a really supportive community. And I was surprised that it's n- like, Police officers are not just a gun community. Like there, there are people that are bad shots as law enforcement <laughs> officers. Not so much on SWAT, but like yeah, on yeah. the street and stuff. And and uh, it was just kind of interesting to see that perspective. Right, because they are willing to to help you. Um, like when I first started, I just carried a, a side, you know, just a pistol. I didn't carry it in AR and stuff like that. So I was pretty proficient, you know, and felt as time goes on, it's been I don't know, 13, 14 years, maybe or longer, you know, starting out doing it and I became more, you know, really comfortable with my gun, but you have to be open and honest, you know, cause I wasn't a big gun guy either kind of getting into it. And so I hadn't been around a lot of, you know, weapons and stuff like that. So being open and honest and just saying, Hey, I, I need some extra help. I don't really understand this maybe quite as much as you, you guys do, because on the SWAT teams, you're right. There are some guys that are, I'm like, man, they are awesome awesome shots yeah and like i feel like there's most SWAT teams will have like at least one dude that was special forces and some branch or something like these guys are no joke i i remember going into my qualification while i was trying out for the SWAT team and they had deferred my application because i had gotten in a motorcycle wreck dislocated my shoulder oh shoot and one of the the things was a bench press and they were nice enough to allow me to like hold it off for two weeks but we went out to do this call where you had to do 90% shotgun, 90% pistol, 90% uh, AR. And it's like pouring rain and it's like 36 degrees. And the it was one of the team leaders and he was just a grumpy dude. Super nice dude, but super <laughs> grumpy. And he looked at me. He was like, Sam, you better not be fucking with me right now. Like you, you have to do this. <laughs> yeah. If you don't, I'm going to be pissed. So it was like, it was max pressure, horrible conditions. He's just not having it. He's not happy. He doesn't want to be there, but he's going to do it. Um, That was kind of my intro to, to the team at least. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, those SWAT commanders and, you know, team leads, they could kind of be grumpy. They got a lot of pressure on them. Oh, absolutely. I, those are my favorite people in any public service though, is that the, the people that are just like, uh rbf and they don't mess around and they don't give you a smile ever but they're really solid people like they're just so much fun to work with because once you get to know them you can kind of uh make fun of them a little bit and and rib them and get that grumpy to come out a little bit more yeah yeah i mean you really do have to like you're talking about those little micro interactions and stuff like that because when it's actual go time like and everybody turns on on their game face i mean you can, you can really see that in, in yeah. people, you can see their, their seriousness and, and desire to carry out the mission, um, as safely as possible and effectively as possible. Yeah. And for you guys, are you guys, uh, sworn within the team and are you entry or do you carry as like a self-defense option uh, uh, as you go in? So, yeah, we carry and we, we do entry as well. Yeah. And, and that's like. So that's how it was while I was in Iowa. We were sworn we had, uh, we were fully armed with them. We were entry team members first, medic second. Um, But even then, like you're kind of looked at as a liability because like all of these career guys that have a lot of experience, like are in there doing this every day and you're the hobbyist, you know, on the outside. (laughs) And like now it's even worse in Colorado because we're not sworn. Uh, So we, we're not armed. We're like marshmallows that have to be babysat. Um, so we'll do entry with them, but like you can be a liability very easily and you can be looked at as a liability even easier. So like really having that trust and that rapport going into it is so critical, so important, uh, yeah. if you want to actually be effective. Right. And it's, 
all on your attitude that you you have and are displaying yeah i i mean attitudes everything uh that's attitudes everything not just in thames not just in ems fire please like attitude i think has gotten me every big success i've had within this career every job i've gotten i think i can attribute at least a partial uh to attitude and i think that is what burns people in this career field so quickly yeah yeah i i I would agree with you like how do you set set yourself up maybe to like have that good attitude here are five tips if you're feeling stuck in your life still one take full responsibility of your life don't be that victim anymore you have to get past that number two praise and enjoy the process focus on the journey when things get tough Focus on the end, where you're headed, and why you're headed there. If you truly know, those little things are not going to knock you off your track. Number three, become anti-fragile. Once again, don't let those little things knock you down. Learn a breathing process so you can get through them and not get stuck in that moment. Number four, cut out the crappy friends that are sucking the life out of you because You can't excel if you're around a bunch of crappy friends that are not going to help you excel. And number five, you need to cultivate grit and perseverance. Knowing your journey and having it written down and having a destination is going to keep you on track and help you with that grit and perseverance on getting you to where you want to be. Now let's jump right back into this episode. I I think number one is that you have to identify the people like, it's really hard to, what did my, my old mentor say? He said, it's hard to uh, soar like an eagle when you're surrounded by turkeys. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to the firehouse that's like kind of known as the curmudgeon firehouse and they didn't all start out that way. Like they're not all grumpy dudes. (laughs) There was one or two that had a really bad attitude and it infects everybody around them. And it's very hard. and, And I know it's really hard because I've been in that situation to really break out of that because you know, it, it's infectious. You're around it all the time. You start like, you start regurgitating it. It's almost like a way to fit in with them is to, you know, complain about the system, complain about what's going on. So really, first and foremost, like trying to surround yourself with people with good attitudes. Um, sometimes that's easier said than done because you can't always have your dream shift assignment with your best buddies ever. Um, but, you know, trying to get away from those people and then just making it a con- a conscious effort like hey i'm going to work i'm not going to complain today um i or stopping yourself in that mid thought mid conversation where you're complaining about something because it really doesn't get you anywhere that doesn't mean you have to be a pushover that doesn't mean you have sure. to like accept bad condition accept bad managers but there are constructive ways to go about that and complaining to your buddy about it nonstop doesn't help anybody right and that turns infectious like you're saying in it in a negative way and it's so hard to stop that um i guess men crew mentality i would say uh and just not continually feeding in it someone's got to be the person that's kind of steps up or steps back and say hey let's like move on this is not getting us anywhere yeah and that's a good point too is that if you step up like it's infectious in both directions yeah if you come in you've got a good attitude it's a little bit harder to get those people to come around but if you come in and you've got a good attitude you're like yeah let's run calls today it it people will will kind of bring that in they they're going to tease you a little bit for being the gung-ho guy <laughs> um which has been me most of the my career but um we even see it now like in flights is that we've got um a couple pilots that are just, they just really want to fly and when we come in with them and they're like man let's go fly let's go do something cool and like that gets you amped up and now sure. we're saying like yeah let's go fly like the tones drop you don't get that like you know curse at the wall like oh come on do we really have to <laughs> you know and people get amped up and you just have a better day uh you know whether or not you get wrecked whether or not you you get blown out and have nothing it's just a better experience for everybody so i my feeling in in my career now is why not why not yeah. just come into work and just be ready for anything and you know embrace the suck if it sucks but you know, if you're verbally saying things that are that are good, like if you're if you're excited, even though you have this like pit of dread and you really don't want to get out of bed for that call, that can kind of almost turn yourself. It can turn yourself around if you're emoting this positive attitude, even yeah. if you don't feel it. Yeah. I mean, how does like 
how does one like maybe turn themselves around, you know, that maybe like, Hey, they're listening to this. And I had, I've been that guy, like, you know, I've gone through some struggles in life and my career. And how do I turn this around? Because I don't really want this to follow me the rest of my career. You know, I, I don't have a good answer for that because I still catch myself, um, you know, through phases of burnout here and there, you know, through where things just aren't going right for me. I still catch myself being the negative Nancy and where I've had success, like turning it around is just that conscious effort. Um, you know, just like telling myself if there's an action that I don't want to do, like saying like very blatantly in my head, you're not going to say that today. You are not going to engage with this person. You are not going to complain about this. You're not going to call the administrator on call. Like, and just having that like really blatant self conversation and then repeating it, you know, not just doing it one day, doing it like, all right, I can do it another shift and another shift. And if you get, you know, usually for me, it's two or three shifts. If I can consciously do that, I can see an actual shift in my attitude and my mindset going to work. Um, but it doesn't always work. And, and that's that I think is the hard truth is that nobody's perfect. And even the most optimistic yeah. person out there is going to have bad days and struggles, especially in this career. Yeah. I think sometimes we, we want to be perfect and we look at everybody else, maybe sometimes that they should be perfect, but that's just not the reality of, uh, any job or any situation really is just, you know, the trying to make everybody perfect and yourself perfect. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. And not getting discouraged if you do slip up, if you do have a bad day, um, you know, and, and not comparing yourself to other people because, again, like there are people that I look up to a, a lot in where I work. And, you know, it's it's easy to be like, oh, man, like I, I had a bad day. I said some stuff I didn't really like I don't feel good about, you know, and then comparing yourself to them like, oh, man, well, I'm never going to be like that. So, you know, screw everything. You yeah. know, it, I, I think just kind of taking a healthy middle road with yourself and being able to you know, understand you're human, but still hold yourself to a high standard. Right. This job is just kind of like it comes in waves, right? It's just those waves can be, I think, in certain points in my career, they're really big, right? Really big shifts up, up and down. I think over time, I've learned how to better kind of maybe smooth out those waves, you know, that are that are happening in life and happening in, in your career. Once you kind of figure out, you know, this positive mental attitude or self-talk and things like that. I think you really can smooth things out for yourself. And not only does it make life better for you, it makes life better for the people you're working with and what, right. Most importantly, the people we're serving. Yeah. And, and I think putting it like that, like the career is, it comes in waves, I think is, is really astute because I, it does, you know, you have, and I think a lot of people get, they get in like a, a valley right before the swell and they're like, I hate this job. And that's where they, they truly burn out. They, you know, leave and something, and instead of like sitting on it and waiting for the next swell to come along and, you know, get another high from that. But, you know, I think also like understanding how to conserve and how to expel your energy in those cycles is super important. You know, when you start getting burned out, a lot of times, like, yes, employers can be bad. Yes, like pay can be a factor, family life, all of that can be a factor. But a lot of times burnout comes from within. Burnout stuff you're doing to yourself. Like, how are you sleeping? Uh, are you picking up a lot of overtime? Are you drinking a crap ton of caffeine? Are you going to like bed on, like a lot of it revolves around sleeping. Are you know, yeah. are you working out? Are you eating well? Like all of these things, even though they don't feel connected to the fact that you've run your 18th dialysis transfer of the shift, like they can help you handle those better. So, you know, in those, you know, highs, sure, pick up some overtime, you know, go, you know, do some special projects. But when you're in a low, like kind of being able to shed some of that responsibility, you know, go on autopilot for a little bit, you know, take care of yourself and then regroup to kind of give it another push is really important. Yeah, you have to find a way to recharge yourself, you know, con constantly because it, it is draining when you're working lots of hours and being up late and you can fall out of all those good habits of working out, eating right, monitoring, caffeine, drinking, all those things like you and they are so, so, so connected. Yeah, you know, it, it's it doesn't come with like one thing 
Um, you know, that I, you know, I don't have any actual stats to back it up, but I think every study I've ever seen on like job performance and happiness, like a raise has very little to do with it. That's not sure. to say people don't deserve more money and that <laughs> yeah. wouldn't help, you know, with lifestyle and all of that. But like, you know, people think like I'm this down and I'm this depressed and I'm this unhappy because I make, you know, $10 an hour less than such and such or whatever department. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's not the only factor. That's one of the factors, but just being able to, you, you can't always control that, but you can always control what you're doing yourself. And I, I think that's really important. Yeah. I mean, do you find yourself like, you know, talking about, you know, let's, we're kind of drifting down into a little bit of mental health and stuff like that, but do you, do you ever find yourself like it's not okay to be okay type of thing or vice right. versa? <laughs> you know, so I am very fortunate. Uh, I have not had any mental health struggles um, related to the job. Really like that's, that's something that has worked out really well for me. And I don't think it's because, you know, I'm amazing or super strong or, you know, better than anybody else. It's just my luck of the draw. You know, I've got bad shoulders, but you know, my, my mental health seems to be intact and pretty, pretty steady. Um, but what I've noticed recently, uh, and, and it's hard to quantify, uh, because we have a lot of like really new employees coming into the workforce right now. Sure. We have a lot of really new EMTs and paramedics, and it, it's really hard to point at individual circumstances, say this is the case, but it seems to me that we have such an emphasis on mental health that we have this wave of people almost getting told, like, you're going to get a mental health disorder. Like, I've had people yeah. in my comments say, like, this career isn't worth it because you're going to be messed up mentally. Like, you are going to get PTSD. You are going to get suicidal. And we're kind of like, we're, we're accepting, which is really great. And we're like getting people the help they need. But at the same time, we're almost putting it on some people or they're using it as, as a, a, uh, not attention seeking, but like, uh, almost like the, the crowd, like the cool kids club, like, man, I'm with a salty medic and I've got PTSD <laughs> and I'm part of the cool kids crowd. And what that does is that we have all of this great stuff for these people, but it still leaves out the people that are really suffering from these things. Like we have all of this visibility up top for these, you know, uh, flashy issues and people are still falling through the cracks. You know, it, it's in my mind, I don't think we're getting to the demographic that really needs help because those people aren't the people you, you know, I've had several friends in this career field and uh, even more acquaintances kill themselves. And none of them were the people that I, I knew anything about this mental yeah. health disorder. I didn't, I didn't, they never talked about it and it happened. And you're like, wow, really? Like it was like Gary, really? Yeah. And, and it just, you know, and it's so hard to talk about because, you know, it it's I understand like how this could come across as offensive to somebody, but it really does feel like we we are over glorifying mental health issues in one group while kind of taking away that spotlight from the group that actually needs it. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of mind boggling what you're saying to me. And like, I'm trying to like, wow, how do we figure that out? How do we reach that demographic? Um you know, I mean, it, it's hard because you can't call bullshit on somebody. You you can't yeah. like look at somebody and when they say I'm having these issues, I'm depressed, I have PTSD. You can't just go and you can't just say like, no, you're like you're full of crap uh, because that's a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for even more people falling through the cracks and not seeking treatment. And that's kind of what got us in this situation in the first place is uh, kind of denying that this stuff is going on. So. I don't have a good answer for it. I just, I get irritated, you know, when it's, it's almost like forced on people. And like, I, what I'd say is that every statistic I've read still says that you are more likely not to have a mental disorder than you are to have one. It's still common. I think it's like one in four. And I think it's a little bit higher rates within EMS, something like that. Mm -hmm. But you know, the the notion that you're going to get PTSD, that you're going to have these emotional reactions, I think is is wrong. You know, that's not yeah. the case for everybody. And people have to understand that that like I've seen some pretty traumatic things in, you know, 10 years as a paramedic, 12 in EMS, and I haven't lost any sleep over it yet. 
you know, I haven't had any major issues. I see a counselor, I talk to somebody, but, um, you know, you're, it, it's okay to be okay. Kind of coming full circle to where you <laughs> yeah. came. Is that like, it, it's okay to be okay. And it's actually kind of more common not to have those issues. Um, so I wouldn't want anybody to be afraid of this career path because, uh, of the fear of getting PTSD or some other um, kind of emotional disorder. I, I think what I've seen more of is EMS exacerbating pre-existing issues. I haven't seen it like create issues out of nothing very often, but usually it will make things a lot worse, you know, between bad sleep, gas station burritos at 1 a.m., <laughs> yeah. you know, nonstop calls, and then throw some traumatic stuff on top of that. And then if you you had some anxiety and some depression before, like that could amplify it beyond that if you're not cognizant of it yeah and i can't remember and i just i want to say 35 percent of people already getting into you know as a first responder already have some issues and then you're right this career field will exacerbate them probably quite rapidly just because maybe you know undealt issues like in your in your past yeah. and so I think that's probably like a big thing where maybe some people are maybe falling through the cracks is, you know, getting into this profession, maybe not realizing what they're kind of maybe some of the baggage that they have been carrying into this. And then, you know, like I said, all this, all those things that are connected end up, you know, kind of cracking the egg open and turning into, you know, these ex extreme conditions where, you know, you, a lot of people have PTSD or have other issues for me, it was not like one, um, one thing I would say that like, oh yeah, this is what caused my PTSD or whatever. It was like accumulation of a lot of things and things I had not even thought of that probably ha that happened in my childhood and past that kind of probably brought things full, full circle to, for me to realize, yeah, I've got some things that I, I need to work out and to be a better person. I'm always striving to be like, you know, that better person. Like I've gotten some ketamine treatments. I just got this new gangling steroid shot. Like I'm just trying to find like the best version of me. Like what did that, what was, was it, where was that in my career? Where was that right. best version of me at? Yeah. And, and I think it, like, it sounds like you have been really good at seeking out things to try and trying things and, you know, looking at like, I know I have these issues. I've identified that, which is the hard part for a lot of people because they haven't identified it. They haven't gone, you know, been diagnosed with anything, but they're having these thoughts, these feelings, um, these daily struggles that they have either internalized as normal or just refuse to talk about. So you found that help. It sounds like you've been creative in your solution with like ketamine treatments, which I've heard amazing things about from so many people. Um, but it's kind of like, I guess I'd look at it like a, a master's program or a doctoral program is that if through undergrad, like before your career started in EMS, you have to have those study habits. And if you go into EMS and you have a good grasp on your mental health, doesn't mean your mental health is perfect, but if right. you're doing really good going into it and like, hey, I see a counselor, I'm on these medications, I know this does well, I know how to handle these anxiety attacks or the days I can't get out of bed or the suicidal ideation, like I know how to handle these things, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, much more successful in EMS than the person coming in that doesn't have these ingrained uh, uh, skills, these things that they've learned over time, they don't know how to handle their mental health. And now, like you said, if it's been exacerbated and now you're kind of playing catch up because you're trying to figure out your mental health while still being like, you can't just stop working. You know, yeah. you, you've devoted so much to school, you've devoted so much time. So, you know, I, having those, that self-awareness going in, I think is, is huge for people. And it's cool that you're, you're trying all those things. Did you notice a big difference with the ketamine treatment out of curiosity? Um, if you don't mind I, me asking. No, you're, no, I'm totally fine talking about it. I, I think I have, it took a little bit longer than I thought it would take and to maybe see the results, but it's definitely, definitely helped. I had this, I'll talk about it and hopefully I won't get emotional about it, but I had this weird feeling quite often, just like, I'd kind of like this emotion that where I would want to cry. And it was just like, I, I'm like, I don't know why I had this emotion. Like, I just like, it would be at these weird times and stuff like that. 
And I was like, gosh, this is just something that's like bothersome to me to have this emotion. And it's great to be sensitive and caring and empathetic right, right. and all these things. But I'm like, sometimes that that wasn't really matching. So that really has subsided. And I feel like that's kind of, I, there's been other things that have subsided, but definitely was something that I was like, I'm glad that has kind of like passed. You know, and I think you're right. You you touched on something that's I think very important is the skill set. Like your your health and your mental health is is a developing a skill set. Yeah. Like you 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 have to figure that out and, and, and work on it constantly, work on it. Just like your SWAT skills or your EMS skills or your firefighting skills, you still have to constantly work at that skill set and developing one, you know, before getting to this career field is even more important, I think. And I think maybe that's kind of where things are maybe um, are starting to pick up is that education and developing that skill set and the knowledge. Um, because sometimes we feel these thoughts and feelings and emotion and we're like, oh, that that's bad. This is this is not normal. When they are completely normal feelings that every human has. Like I don't we all have these base set of feelings that come through through our lives. Right. Right. And you know, and I guess looking at mental health is just health. You know, if I dislocated my shoulder in a motorcycle accident and, you know, after that, I went to rehab and worked on it and I learned how to strengthen that shoulder and all of those muscle groups that were so messed up for it. And then I was able to go bench a bar for the SWAT tryouts and, you know, hit a PR on that and, you know, felt really good about it. But if I had gone, I dislocated my shoulder and then the next day popped it back in and went to try to bench that bar, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah, you know, and that yeah. that bar is the stress. I guess you could look at it as like the stress of EMS, the stress of fire, you know, all of that stuff. If you, you know, have this issue and you just go into it headlong without putting in any effort, like you're going to fail. And and honestly, you know, that system failing you. If you want like well, like that's where the responsibility for you you know, that that's on you, you know, and that's where you have to seek that help. And I think what we can do, um, or the best thing we can do for people is just make sure that those resources are easily searchable, easily available. Um, but a lot of mental health comes with, with, uh, that responsibility of seeking it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And to do that, you gotta, you gotta know yourself. And I feel like, we are in a society of just constantly being bombarded by information to have information uh, constantly, right? At our just fingertips and our phone or computers and everywhere we're looking, we're being bombarded by information. But you have to take that time with yourself, like that alone time. Um, I know some people just don't like being alone at all. And I'm like, I, I like to be alone sometimes, yeah. you know, to be with my thoughts and you know, or be out in nature or whatever, just to just be alone. Right. And so it's interesting because, you know, I, and I think that's, that's something that we still don't understand well about mental health is that, you know, everybody is different, like depression, anxiety, PTSD, or just sad feelings mm -hmm. are going to be different for everybody. And I guess I've found and kind of where that like, it's okay to be okay. And some of those frustrations for me have come from is I remember a call uh, way early in my career. And it was, you know, this poor uh, young teenager sexually assaulted, ended up uh, hanging herself in her closet. It was a really tragic, really tragic story. Um, and, you know, so we did a debrief. We all, our department was really good. They got us, you know, a, a grief counselor to talk to for it. And uh, having divorced parents, having been in <laughs> counseling since I was very little, you know, I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go talk to somebody. I don't, I don't care. I, yeah. You know, why not? And talking to him, but what I feel like they did wrong is we went into it and they almost assumed how I was feeling and people mm -hmm. assumed how I was dealing with it. And honestly, I was dealing with it fine. You know, it was sad. I was definitely sad that day. Yeah. I definitely didn't want to run other calls that day. But at the same time, it was like, okay, it happened. You know, it would have happened if I was here or not. Like that was super right. sad, but like, let's move on. And it, there was almost this assumption that I would have issues for it. And it, I think it's probably, I, if I was to extrapolate that, I would assume that somebody that's having a hard time with that would also feel the same way of, you know, you're assuming that I feel this way, but actually like this is the more nuanced part, like this related to, you know, I, they remind me of my cousin or my sister or, 
you know, I don't feel, I, I feel sad, but it's a little bit more prolonged, you know, I, whatever it is like there, it's going to present differently. And like you said earlier, which I think is a good point is that these things are not one thing, you know, you didn't go on one car call and were scarred forever. You yeah. know, it was, you know, built up things. It was, you know, probably some pre-existing things on top of that car crash, on top of that suicide, on top of that, you know, house fire, you know, yeah. all of yeah. those things compound. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, if you listening to you talk about like, like the counseling stuff like that, I think if you're pushing like, oh, you should feel this way, you should feel this way. And you're not, and you're like, mm, then you kind of wonder, is there something wrong with me? Am I yeah. just a cold hearted asshole, you know? Right. Like I, I think at one point, like there was something and I like people were like, there was some, I don't even remember what the call was, but I remember people were so upset about it. And like, I just wanted to go eat lunch. And I think I probably Googled like, what's a sociopath? Because, <laughs> you know, you just, you, it, people deal with it differently. Yeah. Um, and, you know, being able to move on and not really losing sleep or bring it home, like that's totally fine. You know, if right. that's how you're, but so conversely, like, it's totally fine if it's hard to move on from that. Right. Um, my employer right now is pretty good. Like if you do some traumatic stuff during your shift, like you can go talk to them and they'll, they'll get you off the street for the day. They'll get you home, you know, if that's what you need, or, you know, they'll put you in an office job for the day if that's what you need. So, you know, I think just understanding both sides of it and, you know, to be completely honest, I don't, it's hard for me to put myself in the shoe in shoes of others because I haven't experienced it. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I'm probably not the person that somebody that's having a mental health crisis, really not crisis because like, obviously I'd be there for somebody if they called me, sure. you know, I'd go over to the house, whatever. But I, I'm not the one that can emphasize, em, emphasize bleh, with somebody, um, you know, going through these issues. And I think it's important to find people that can, that have gone through similar things. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really, really great point. And I, I love that your employer and other employers are doing this or kind of giving people a break. I think, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the officers just like it's from can be one of those days where it's like one traumatic call to another traumatic call. And I yeah. think that's where you kind of like when you have those repeated traumatic calls in a row, you're not giving yourself any time to kind of like process. And that's where how it starts to kind of like build up. And then you just right. I had so many traumatic calls today and I'm just shelving everything all my emotions and feelings to get through the day yeah and where i've noticed that is like like you said it builds up through the day you don't even realize it's building up you're like cool we're cool like let's go around another like let's embrace the suck let's just do a bunch <laughs> of traumatic stuff today uh and then you go home and i don't even realize i'm doing it half the time and but all of a sudden my wife and i are fighting or you know they're you know i and what it is, is it's you go from this, like you're at this work, your mindset, and then you go home and no, you're not taking it out on them, but you're a different person. You know, you're yeah. not the same. And that's where I've noticed it on, on myself is that, you know, it takes me time to get home and to reacclimate to being home to, you know, kind of shed all of that stress that's built up through the day, even if it wasn't traumatic, even if it was just 19 calls in 24 hours and you're just done you know, being able to kind of come home and let that go. And that's been a learning experience for both my wife and I is that I can now communicate with her better and just say, I'm not myself right now. Like, it's going to be a second, like I'm still decompressing. It helps because I have like an hour and 15 minute commute home. So like I can listen to an audiobook and music and get myself in a different mindset. Yeah. Um, and when I, when I recognize it, I'm okay. When I don't recognize it, that's when problems occur in my home life, at least. Sure. That's, I think any first responder listening is like, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, if you're not, you're, you probably are doing it and you, and you don't realize, I think you're, you, you're so correct. Like shifting that gear from going from work to home and home to work. I shift those gears like the night before I go to work, like there's a gear that kind of shifts and like my mental prep is different and getting my stuff ready to go to work. Like I have a system and a routine, um, you know, and unfortunately, unfortunately, and unfortunately I live in the same city I, I work for. So like, it's a 10 minute drive, drive home. And like, I got to be better about shifting that gear when I, when I get home and it's can be really hard. Even 
having so much, I feel like knowledge and stuff like that is still just sometimes really hard to implement and even shifting gear to go to like SWAT training or, uh, you know, or a call out and stuff like that. Those, those gears shift pretty, pretty fast. And the downshift when you come home is, is really hard. And I think my wife's like, I, I don't really like that shift in yep. you. Like you have to go to a call out or you're going to SWAT training. Yeah. And I, I personally, like, I'm sure there are things that say like in the long run, it's not as good or whatever, but I like the 24 hour shifts, the 48 hour shifts, because that allows me to get to work, to shift into the mindset, be there, you know, be fully engaged and then go home and, and then get out of it instead of, you know, eight hour shifts, which we used to work in Iowa, where it was like, you'd go to work, you'd get in that zone a little bit, then you'd come home and you'd be grumpy and then you'd go right back <laughs> to work. And I like having those really delineated, like, I'm here. This is what I'm doing. Now I'm home. This is what I'm doing and not having any blending, which is like you said, with SWAT training, it's hard because they're four hours long. You know, you drive, you go to SWAT training, you kind of get in that headspace and then you go home and you're kind of amped up and you're, you don't know what to do with yourself. And those yeah. ones are where I have more trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, and I feel for the officers, um, you know, the work like the 12 hour shifts and then they're off for 12 and then back on. And I'm like, that's brutal. That's just yeah. brutal. Like trying, like you're not getting any sleep, like any good quality sleep. And like, that's for me, sleep is like my emotional thing. Like if my sleep is not on and off, if it's off, I am, I'm that grumpy guy. Like, you know, my fuse is shorter and I'm not a happy camper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, there's a book that talks about it, and I won't even try to quote it, but I think it's like the emo emotional survival for the law enforcement officer. Uh, my department in Iowa, actually, it was required reading through part of their onboarding, and it talked about a lot of this stuff about how going to work is traditionally it would be a military member or police officer, but now like EMS, especially street corner posted, fire yeah. departments, you have this like hyper alertness while you're at work and you're kind of you're always looking for things, you know, BSI scene safe. Is the scene safe? I don't know. Looking around <laughs> all the time. And then you go home and, and that's, it's almost like coming off caffeine, you know, it's that, that initial drop. But, um, I know there's actual, there's stuff to back up these feelings, right. um, that I think pretty much everybody experiences. Like you said, I think anybody listening to this that works in the career goes, yeah, yeah, I've, I've had that. Yeah. And now, now that you, realize that the difficult part is uh figuring out how to change that and and make the rest of your life work because this is a career this is and it sometimes can be all consuming of your life and i and i i personally have let that happen yeah. but then you have to kind of like reel yourself in and like that this is this is a career this is a job i can't let it consume me and be my total identity oh absolutely i mean and, and look at behind me i'm at home and yeah, this is a YouTube studio, but like, what does my YouTube channel focus on? It focuses on first responders <laughs> and law enforcement, SWAT medicine and all of that. They go to work and it's that and it's so easy for this to become your identity. And so many, so many public safety employees, like they're not, you know, they're nothing without that career or that certification or, you know, that, that specific job. And that's, I don't have an answer for that. Like I let that consume me all the time um, just because it's in so many aspects of my life, but trying to figure out how to separate that. And, you know, like you said, look at it. It's like, this is a job. If you lose this job tomorrow, like life will go on and having something else on the side. I, I think having hobbies that are completely unrelated and friends that have nothing yeah. to do with medicine or fire or police, like they're the best people to be around. Uh, or and to have those friends because especially in the fire department i mean they're your family you live with yeah. them you know one third of your life is with them and they're going to become close friends and you're going to like have parties and stuff but having those things that have nothing to do with it is so important it's you know you you're out in utah right yeah and you know i'm out in colorado there's stuff to do like you can do things that are not related that get you totally out of the mindset but i i think that's super super important yeah i've noticed you know this is certain like podcasting is it's kind of a hobby in in a, in a lot of ways um i super enjoy it and you know it's great to talk to you know people like yourself sam and it's just like but yeah it's like 
hobbies are they in this career field i feel like they just slowly fade away and then it becomes all consuming of my my career and trying to trying to keep that balance through your career is so important yeah and and that balance looks different for everybody you know if it's okay for i for this to be a big part of your life for firefighting or public safety to be a big part of your life and to enjoy it and to have hobbies that revolve around it i so that balance is not always going to be like a totally even scale, but just having something else. Like for me, what I found is videography, you know, and that ties in well to YouTube and I use it for that. But like, also I brought my cameras and stuff out to a friend's wedding and got to, you know, uh, video some of that. And it's one of those things where it's like, all right, if I got hurt on the job, if I wasn't able to do this anymore, if I was you know medically retired or my mental health couldn't handle it, like I can go do this other thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice to have. (laughs) Yeah. Some, something else. Um, I visited a fire department in Finland, uh, and it was the Helsinki fire department, which was rated as like the second most advanced in the world. Uh, second only to medic one, I believe for just like how they respond. They've got anesthesiologists on fly cars. Really cool. Talking to one of the firefighters, he said that before you could get hired on this fire department, you had to have a education in a different career so almost all of them are tradesmen of some kind before they're carpenters plumbers uh, electricians um, or something like accounting before you can go get educated and get on with the fire department i thought that was super cool because their thought is is that they one they don't want the government to pick up the bill if you get hurt on the job or you go on disability they want you to have something else but two it gives you something outside of work so that nothing it doesn't all revolve around firefighting. I, I just thought that was really neat um, that they were doing that. Yeah, that is super cool. Sam, what what caused you to like get into creating a YouTube channel? And is it is it a medic prep? Is that the YouTube channel? Uh, prep medic. Prep so, medic, sorry. No, all good. Um, you know, it kind of goes along with the SWAT medicine side is that it was a... Okay, community need sounds like I'm, I'm patting myself on the back a little bit too much, but... There was a lack. Um, you know, you go on YouTube and you have a lot of law enforcement officers on YouTube. You got, you know, Donut Operator, Mike the Cop, uh, uh, Angry Cops, you know, yeah. all of the <laughs> you've got a lot of representation there um on social media. And then, you know, you have a lot of nursing stuff. There's a lot of educational stuff for nursing on there, and you have uh, firefighters. Uh, my favorite right now is um, uh, fire department coffee guy. I always forget yeah, his name. DC. Yeah, the, like, yeah, he's the, freaking awesome. Firefighter um, Chronicles. <laughs> yeah, firefighter. That's it. That's it. Uh, so like, I I love his stuff, but you don't have paramedics. Um, when I started looking, there was a skinny medic, and that was it. There were no paramedics on YouTube, and there was nobody to like look at to learn more about the profession to do any of that and then there was nothing to like educate people on like home first aid you have like some preppers that are teaching people how to put in ivs backwards you know and and telling you that saline's going to save everybody's lives if they can do this one thing but there wasn't good pre-hospital education so we had this call out in the middle of nowhere iowa and it was a super cool like prolonged field care guy's arm stuck in an auger and we ended up like RSIing him giving a huge cocktail of meds for uh his developing crush syndrome and like doing all of these super advanced things we were doing it on our own you know we're out there with one other paramedic and this volunteer fire department trying to get this guy out of this grain silo and we got back we had an opening uh for an application and we had one applicant and he was a felon and we weren't going to hire him yeah and that was like for me that was the moment where i was like oh this is this is this kind of sucks because we did something that's really cool i'm making a decent living uh you, you this is so unique and that's where i i had a camera my wife had bought me a camera for christmas and i was doing like little ski edits and stuff i was like you know what i'm going to do some research i'm going to start a youtube channel and delved into the market and found an opening there to start creating content. Um, so my content usually it revolves around like four main things, three, four main things where it's, you know, education on EMS, you know, how do you become a flight medic? What is the path to get there? You know, do you want to be a firefighter? Like, how do you become a firefighter? How do you, you know, go uh, navigate this career? Because it's not 
simple. Like, do I have to be an EMT? Yeah. Do I like what? What do I have to do? And then the next thing is is like community education, and I saw that as a need where we have all of these issues. And and I don't know about you, I've never had a neurologic recovery in cardiac arrest from somebody that bystanders didn't start CPR first. Right. I, right. I've never seen somebody live. So that to me says that there's a huge thing that bystanders can play, but people don't aren't trained. They don't feel comfortable to do it. And then, you know, you look at things like tragedies like Sandy Hook, where you have these kids dying or or Columbine, even where there's lack of education on bleeding control. And we kind of look at the system and we say, the system's going to save me. Well, it takes you three minutes to bleed out of your femoral artery, and it takes you a national average of about six minutes for an ambulance to get to your doorstep. So you can do the math and determine that you have to be your own first responder in those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like that's the other part is like helping the community respond um, for themselves and to like you, you don't need – you should do an in-person class, but you don't need an in-person class to learn the basics of shoving a T-shirt into somebody's uh, arterial hemorrhage. So looking at that and then the rest of it is just for my own enjoyment and because I love what I do and I'm proud of what I do, it's kind of fun to have footage and and show people what the career is like. So, you know, really kind of focusing on those main things. And I I don't know this for sure, but I feel like I found success because it wasn't there, because there was a community need mm -hmm. uh, for it. There was something that that. I could do. And that's where I've had most of the success in my career, like I said before, is, you know, identifying swap medicine to the YouTube channel. Now, um, we're, we looked at like, uh, uh, dogs, we've got a lot of dogs up in the mountains doing search and rescue, even yeah. our SWAT dogs doing warrants in the middle of nowhere. So we're starting a program with my flight service to load, a, a one of the handlers up and their dog when they get shot or heat stroke and flying them directly to a vet clinic. So like, if if you look in your community and use you, you probably have the skill set to address one of its needs and that's a really powerful way to get i think it, longevity in this career is to like take take an active role within your community not just sitting back and waiting for tragedy to strike like going out and figuring out how you can help like do you like you know do you like working with kids? You can go do, you know, stuff with them to educate them on fire safety. You know, do you like, you know, I don't know, any, anything. Yeah, you can do yeah. anything with it. And we all have a skill set that we can apply. Or you can go get a skill set like I did with SWAT Medicine. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And you're, you're like one of my favorite guests where like I love when guests see a need and go out there and fill it like that is that's powerful. Yeah. And, and it's, it's self-serving too. Like, it's not just like, oh man, look at how altruistic I am. Like, you know, it helps if you do it, it helps you. A lot of people complain and they say like EMS isn't a career. I, I disagree. I think EMS is a career. I think it's tough right now. I think you have to work hard at it, but being integrated with your community is super important. And it's cool that you work in the same community you live in. Like I get it. There are huge downsides to that. And I don't do that right now. Uh, but like at the same time, you're trusting your family to the people that you work with, to, you know, the, the hospital system and to the nurses and the doctors and to the firefighters. And you're invested in your community. And yeah. I find that investment by finding things to do for them. And I, I think that makes this a career, honestly. Yeah, that's super awesome. Sam, how where can people find you and, and like follow you? Sure. So you can find me primarily on YouTube. Uh it's at Prep Medic is the new handles they're going out uh with. Or uh Instagram, I'm prep underscore medic. I don't know who at prep medic is, but I want his Instagram handle <laughs> and he won't give it to me. <laughs> he's probably not even using it. <laughs> I know he's not. He's got like one post on it. <laughs> oh shoot, that sucks. Sam, I really appreciate you being on today um, and great conversation um, and people, please, you know, follow Sam and support him. And, you know, he's got some great content out there. That's exactly how, how I found you was the great content you're putting out there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being on today. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you access your podcast. If you know someone that would be great on the show, 
please get a hold of our host, Jerry Dean Lund, through the Instagram handles at Jerry Fire and Fuel or at Enduring the Badge Podcast. Also, by visiting the show's website, EnduringTheBadgePodcast.com, for additional methods of contact and up to date information regarding the show. Remember, the views and opinions expressed during the show solely represent those of our host and the current episode's guest.